Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up and welcome Dr. Anu Pamarnath, Director Geriatrics Apollo Hospitals Bengaluru for his talk this morning. Dr. Amarnath, over to you. Good morning everyone, uh, respected elders and uh, the dignitaries uh, who have come in uh, to this conference. I welcome you all to the second day of the conference. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be over here. Taking forward what Dr. Katosh said, that uh, geriatrics needs to be home-based, care at the point of need, as what we call it. And again, uh, quoting him, uh, the younger generation should take the lead. So we'll try to do what he said and we'll follow in his words. It says uh, in the agenda that it would be a distinguished lecture, but what I thought was instead of lecturing, I, I, agree, I, I am sure that all of you will agree that actions speak more than words. So what I thought was we'll demonstrate something which we've actually done in the setting of home-based care. And uh, this is something which you know I announced yesterday morning during the inaugural that tomorrow morning we'll demonstrate to you that for the first time uh, in India, we have managed to set up an intensive care unit at home. So there's, there's been no other center which has done that, and I'm sure you'll all agree that for an elderly person, uh, what I, I quote myself yesterday, that if you are not able to come to the hospital, we'll ensure that the hospital comes to you. Now, with this background, um, if you can see on the screen, um, I welcome Dr. Jagdish. He's, he's the chief uh, intensivist at the hospital. Good morning, Dr. Jagdish. You can hear me? Good morning, Dr. Jagdish. You can hear me? Yeah, good morning, Dr. Karo. Okay. So we are beaming live from Apollo Hospitals. And initially, uh, I'll give you a brief background of what uh, we have done over here. Uh, that's Dr. Vikram Kamath, a neurologist who's joining us in the background, and we'll have our cardiologist, Dr. Girish, as well, joining in the background. Well, that's Dr. Girish. Uh, Dr. Girish, Dr. Jagdish, and Dr. Vikram, welcome uh, virtually to this conference. We have about 200, 300 people over here. And um, before we begin, I'll just give them a brief background of what we've done. A year ago, we had um, a patient X who came in with an acute cardiac event. And uh, after the cardiac event, we, uh, Dr. Girish and his team successfully managed to uh, stent uh, patient X and then uh, get his heart to function better. But unfortunately, what happened is during the downtime, when the heart was not functioning, he suffered a stroke. That's when Dr. Vikram and his team came on board. And of course, Dr. Jagdish, being the intensivist, was uh, the person in charge of setting this, uh, managing his day-to-day -day care. Eventually what happened is his cardiac function got better, his kidney function got better, his, uh, we had issues with his infection which got better. But uh, the stroke uh, issue which patient X had, uh, that was something which was long standing. So he, re uh, he required for his breathing a separate tube in his neck called the tracheostomy and for the feeding a separate tube in the stomach called a peg tube. Now this went on for quite some time, three months, four months. Then we thought that, you know, uh, this type of patients being in the hospital for a long time doesn't make sense. They need to go back home. But uh, if they do go home, what is the level of care that they get? It's, it's very clear that if it's in the hospital, you get the best amount of care. But when you go home, it's not just the care, but also the expertise that is required. So we decided to ensure that whatever expertise we had at the hospital, we would transfer it to patient X's home. And the question was, how do we monitor it? So that's where technology comes into the picture. Um, during the course of this deliberations, we'll have a, a major lecture by Dr. Umapati, CEO, about technology in geriatrics. But uh, this is a living example of what technology can do for the elderly. So we have a setup at home for patient X, wherein you have nurses uh, on 24-7 on call. We have the equipment, which you can probably see on your screens on this side, which monitors them. And uh, we have a system which I'll be, just be demonstrating in a few minutes, wherein in real time, you know, whatever input is given over there in terms of the pulse, blood pressure, temperature, oxygen levels, as soon as it's entered at the house, we get it in real time at the hospital. And that is how we monitor uh, patient X. So let's start off with uh, the background and uh, with the views of the intensive care person. Dr. Jagdish, uh, good morning. 
Yeah, good morning. Uh, if we can just move the screen to your left so that I can bring you in focus uh, a little bit more to the left. Yeah, thank you. So if you can just uh, you know, uh, speak to the audience, Dr. Jagdish, about the background of how we set up this intensive care unit at home and uh, what has your experience been in managing on a day-to-day -day level. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, see, uh, regarding uh, Dr. Roof has told one of the patients wherein we have to set up the ICU, I mean, close to the ICU facilities at home. We have had few such occasions wherein we have to help the family members to have a facilities which would monitor very close to the extent of what we would do otherwise in ICU at, at their home itself. Uh, basically, it was like a neurologically ill patient uh, and uh, degenerative disorders wherein you know by the nature of the disease to so either remain the same or continue to progress. So naturally the stay in the hospital would be quite expensive, like sort of financial burden. And at the same time to send them to the rehab center, the care they would require and the intensive monitoring they would require may not be able to do it at a rehab center. So that was the time where we decided to start of look into providing sort of ICU care at home itself. So for that, uh, the, re the requirements were like we have to have a uh, sort of trained nurses, we would, we would monitor and sort of alarm us for the change in the parameters which we, would, which we, were, we have told them and sort of updated to inform us or alarm us to take action. And the equipments what we had to have were basically the multi of uh, monitor which would show us uh, the cardiac rhythm which would show us the oxygen saturation, blood pressure and the respiratory rate and the oxygen cylinder or the oxygen concentrator which would provide uh, the supplemental oxygen as in when required and in most of the cases where we had, uh, they were there on the tracheostomy tube, naturally we have had to have this suction operators to give lung dieting as well as to maintain the oral hygiene. So then along with that, we of course had to have uh, a nebulizer and a tear and a pet tear and we would also assist in sort of physiotherapy. So that is how uh, with these equipments and the manpower we, we have managed to set up the facilities what you would otherwise provide in the ICU as such. Yep. Thanks Dr. Jagdish. At this point of time, I'll just get uh, our neurologist, Dr. Vikram Kamath, because in the elderly, we see a lot of neurological problems, and I'm sure uh, most of you uh, would know of somebody who's had stroke, and uh, who's, uh, I, I mean, everyone will know what the background is. If somebody, uh, he or she has a stroke, for, uh, if it's a major one, for all practical purposes, they'll be bed bound. And, uh, you know, taking care of them takes a lot of uh, toll on the carers. So, uh, from a neurological perspective, uh, we'll just get Dr. Vikram Kamat to comment on how uh, he's been able to manage in terms of uh, um, taking care of patient X at home. Uh, Dr. Vikram, over to you. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Apollo Virtual ICU that we have here. Well, just as Dr. Anup uh, mentioned, how patient X, after suffering a heart attack, was left pretty much disabled neurologically and required full-time care. Basically, the patient was dependent on all activities for the, the caregiver was responsible for all day-to-day -day activities. Now, we managed to put up a setup where there would be a nurse round the clock for the patient. Now, there's also a doctor who visits the patient at least once a day to look up all his parameters. And as a neurologist, we expect certain information to come in every day. Simple things like what's the sensorium of the patient in the morning, evening, his ability to communicate and comprehend to what's happening around him and a certain objective assessment of his movements. Now what we do is we would train our doctor as well as the nurse as to what to, how to examine the patient and give the feedback every day on how the progress is taking place. In addition to that, with respect to Mr. X, we've also been able to establish a good home physiotherapy program for him where a physiatrist as well as a physiotherapist comes into the picture. The physiotherapist visits the patient every day and is able to carry out one to two hours of physiotherapy, which is 
that is what is recommended for these patients. On top of that, being in the hospital, the technology allows us to come online anytime and directly visualize the patient. So in the event of any complication that the nursing staff refers to us, they are able to immediately access online and have a direct visual impression of what's happening with the patient. But there are, of course, there are times when for some reason they are not able to make that connection. We have even something called WhatsApp and all today where our nurse is trained to take a short video of what's really happening. Sometimes the patient may have abnormal movements with the fear if the patient is having a convulsion or a seizure. So we train the nurse to really take a short video and that's sent to us just a matter of one to two minutes that we receive the video, we are able to see what happens and give that feedback immediately. Thanks so, a lot, uh, uh, Dr. Vikram. So that, that's kind of a brief background of what we do from the neurological perspective. And finally, we'll get uh, Dr. Girish, uh, you know, the one who actually saved the life uh, in the initial stages. So monitoring a person with cardiac problems at home can uh, be very uh, kind of tricky because heart is something which will behave abnormally and it just takes a few seconds for things to go downhill. So we'll just get Dr. Girish to comment on uh, how we have managed to monitor the cardiac perspective at home. Uh, Dr. Girish, over to you. Good morning, Danu uh, and uh, friends uh, at the conference. I wish you all well. Um, I'm very glad to introduce uh, under direct supervision and uh, idea of Dr. Anu because set up uh, home ICU. It is a beautiful concept and been working well for the last six months. This patient, uh, you know, he was brought to emergency with. Uh, uh, no activity, cardiac activity and the sensorium was absolutely zero. When the defib was connected, it showed a ventricular fibrillation. So immediately it was defibrillated, then the ECG showed an inferior wall ST elevation MI. So moved into the cath lab, angioplasty was done. The vital chemodynamically was stable, but his neurological symptoms did not improve because of the lag period between the VF initiation at his office and the reaching here had caused significant hypoxic brain injury and then it was all left with the neurologist, medical care intensivist and Dr. Anu's idea of you know bringing back a comprehensive uh, complete life uh, into his system not just the vitals. So it required constant monitoring of the uh, cardiac issues especially because he had suffered a myocardial infarction. So the variables that we were monitoring in the ICU we could monitor at his own place like the heart rate, the blood pressure, the postural drop in the blood pressures, the rhythm of normalities, all these have to be monitored constantly because he was an unconscious patient, his uh, heart rate would uh, go up suddenly, we would not know why because is it an autonomic dysfunction or is it an arrhythmia or is it that the patient is not, uh, you know, communicating but there is, his thoughts are causing variation in his uh, rhythm and uh, um, and also this patient required uh, significant uh, uh, rehabilitation which involved tilt tabling, uh, postural, putting in prone uh, uh, and supine. So there would be variations. So we have to keep a close watch on stability of this cardio, neurocardiac uh, autonomic system. And also he had two episodes of supraventricular tachycardia when it was constantly monitored by the nurse and the doctor and a live video feed was given to us whenever there was an abnormal rhythm and we could identify exactly what is the problem and give uh, intravenous adenosine and then we had to get him back to the hospital to ablate uh, AVNRT which is a supraventricular tachycardia related axillary pathway. And uh, we have trained our personnel to uh, identify rhythm of normalities and treat if required with a ventricular fibrillation or uh, cardioversion. So it's it's exactly the same care that can be provided at the ICU in the hospital can be transferred back into patient's family if there is a collective of individuals who are uh, you know driven to be online 24 by 7 in terms of. Uh, video conferencing as well as uh, giving the scientific feedback to the nursing staff as well as the doctor who visits every day. Thank you. Thanks a lot Dr. Girish. So what we have basically shown is that uh, with technology you can have a home based care on par with what you get at the hospital. Um, the reason why we wanted to demonstrate this is uh, this may be an isolated case. It's taken a Herculean effort for us to establish this. 
and most importantly over the course uh, of the last one year uh, the most important thing is that Mr. X uh, is far more stable than what he was in the hospital because this is his home setting. Now the reason why we put this up is because if you can manage a level 3 ICU care at home, I am sure you can manage your day to day consultations with your doctor at home itself. So what we will eventually be looking at uh, from the hospital's perspective is um, if you are not able to come to the hospital for some reason, you can always have a consultation with the doctor and uh, such basic kind of care can easily be provided if you are already able to provide a tertiary level of care. Uh, before I come to the audience, I'll, uh, no, skip that. So I would, I would just like to thank uh, the virtual presence of all the three doctors, uh, Dr. Girish, uh, uh, Dr. Jagdish and uh, uh, Dr. Vikram. Uh, a, a huge thanks to the IT team who are there at the background, they, they're not coming in the foreground. But without them, I don't think this live feed uh, could have been possible. And I don't think we could have managed this patient without the IT support. So Mr. Joshi, Mr. Vinay and uh, Mr. Prajit over here. So they are the IT team. They are the backbone behind all these things. So thanks to all of them. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we will just uh, go out of this, Dr. Girish. Yeah. So uh, just to summarize, uh, you know, the reason why we brought this up was uh, because of the fact that uh, we clearly know for geriatrics, uh, hospital-based management may be just one part of it, managing the acute care. But the bulk of the work needs to be done at home, as Dr. Katosh rightly pointed out. So if we're able to do the higher level of care, there's no doubt that we can do a simple consultation at home. Uh, it would take certain guidelines that we need to follow, and we're still in the process of setting up all those. But eventually, you know, what we promised earlier on, care at your doorstep. So that is what we're aiming to bring uh, eventually. So um, that kind of brings uh, me to the end of my lecture. And I'll probably take a couple of quick questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I would just also like to mention that uh, we have a, a huge crowd here from Dignity Foundation. They're doing a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, uh, senior citizens and home-based care. So I thank all of them, and they've been very supportive in our endeavor to providing home care uh, support from the hospital. So I'll, I'll just take two quick questions before I, I wind up. Uh, uh, the gentleman over there, yes, please. And number two is, uh, do, uh, is it possible for you to demonstrate a case study what you have done in Bangalore uh, of a patient where the home, I mean, ICU is set up uh, at home? This is exactly a case study. No, but uh, in the home, home I mean, can we at see? At home. Yes, you know, yes, uh, yes. For reasons of confidentiality, oh, church. we are not, you know, uh, my initial thought was that we could beam live from patient X's home. But clearly, I'm sure all of you will understand that it's the patient confidentiality which is involved. And as doctors, I don't think we can compromise on okay. patient confidentiality. Okay. So whatever we are talking about is on a real patient. And since we are not able to beam from the home because of confidentiality reasons, we are beaming it from the hospital. So whatever we discuss, everything is happening at the patient's home. And so that's to answer your second question. But what about the uh, conditions? Yeah, in, in to order to answer your first question, you know, it is very individualistic of who can have home-based care. The reason why we took this example is because this is the highest level of care that is required. A person who has a tube in the throat, a person who has a tube in the stomach for feeding. So this requires a lot of expertise. So if you're able to do this one at home, it's very easy to take care of an 80, 90 year old who's just got mobility issues and is bed bound. And all we need to do is monitor their blood parameters and monitor their medication taking. So if we can do level three, level two and level one is a piece of cake. So the criteria would be if it's level one, that is just a visit, uh, you know, a virtual visit to the patient just for a consultation, or level two wherein we just need to give you an injection. So those are a piece of cake. We can do that easily. But for level three and ICU level of care, there are certain criteria that need to be met. We need to have 24-hour nurses. There are certain equipment that are required depending on the patient's profile. But if those criteria are met, I think if we can do this, we can do it for any other patient in India. Okay, then uh, what is the okay. type of cast? Uh, I, I knew somebody would come up with this question <laughs> eventually. <laughs> I was just talking to my doctors over there, and you know, some of uh, one of you will definitely come up with this question. I think we need to look at the cost factor uh, from an overall perspective. Uh, the cost factor for this has been very high, uh, purely because patient X was affordable. Uh, but I think depending on the level of care, 
Say for example, if you have about, uh, uh, if, you, if your requirement is just a one-on-one -on -one consultation with your doctor, so it would be just about 15% more than the actual consultation fees which you pay to the doctor. So it will be as simple as that. But if the requirement is higher, wherein if we need to do a 24-7 monitoring and an ICU level of care, obviously the cost will go up. So it's very difficult to kind of, in this forum, to discuss the precise price points. But I think it would suffice to say that it would not be more than what it would be when you yourself had to come to the hospital. Okay, I'll, I'll just take one more question and then we'll wind up. Dr. Amit? Sir, uh, uh, I'm... Uh... Yes, please. I'm Dr. Rupa Suresh. I'm an internist and a geriatrician from uh, PS Medical College. Uh, the first thing is when I really appreciate that you, you have a great team where they were able to go and deliver the care at home. Costing is definitely an issue in our country. And this sort of care can only be available for those few affordable people in the urban areas. And when you go back to the rural areas, it's practically impossible to have this sort of care given. Uh, but my question is, how old was Mr. X? To answer your first question in terms of um, affordability of care, if you look at the National Program for Health Care of the Elderly, uh, which is uh, in the 11th uh, five-year plan, they've budgeted out about 150 crores. One of the salient features of the National Program is to set up a teleconferencing center. And if that is done through the government, I think the cost at the point of utilization, that is to the patient, will be next to nil. All they need to, to come in uh, at the other end and we would provide them consultation. So as I said, if it comes through the government uh, modality, if it's kind of through the National Program for Healthcare of the Elderly, I don't think cost will be an issue. Um, just because it's a corporate hospital and we've set it up to one patient, it doesn't mean the cost will remain the same for everybody. So once we have the government backup through the National Program, I think the cost will come down. And again, for confidentiality reasons, I don't think I'll be able to uh, let you know the, either the name, the age, the sex of the patient, but we will call it patient X. Yeah, the, the only reason I asked that question is, did... Well, since it's a geriatric conference, there's no doubt that the patient is geriatric. And by definition, we all know what geriatric And uh, was there a discussion with him that this was the way he wanted to live? Because that's very important, because I'm sure we are, a lot of doctors are here, a lot of elderly people are here. How many of us at age 70 plus, I assume, would like to be at home with the tracheostomy and with the PEG tube? And has this been discussed? What are the long-term outcomes? Because this patient is bound to have some sort of infections. Maybe he's not in the hospital, he, he's not going to get hospital-acquired infections. But having bed sores, uh, recurrent UTI from chronic foley or otherwise, and uh, you know, aspiration risk and things, so on and so forth. So uh, how, uh, how often do you think you're going to meet the family to sort of, you know, bring, bring up this point with them, if the, if the children are not in the US? To answer that final question, I'm extremely proud to say that over the last one year, there's been not a single bed sore, not a single infection, not a single aspiration. So that's the quality of home care that is being done. So uh, the reason why we set up this home care is to ensure that, you know, in the hospital we know there'll be uh, uh, cross infection. But once they go home and with the quality of nursing that we've done and with the kind of monitoring that we've done over the last one year, not a single episode, number one. Number two is in terms of what the patient required. You know, we will have to have a lot of deliberations. I'm sure, uh, you know, eventually during the end of the conference, there would be one session in terms of what the patient would require. But since, uh, but the, the, the fundamental question over here is, does patient X have capacity? So if patient X has got capacity or has done uh, advanced directive, then we would need to kind of uh, go in with their views. But unfortunately over here, as you just saw the neurologist discussing, uh, patient X came in unconscious. And uh, after with the treatment, uh, I'm sure with the medical background, you'll know his GCS is about 11. So with that, he doesn't, uh, patient X doesn't have capacity to decide what he or she wants. But the whole family, including the kids, uh, the uh, wife, um, the whole uh, kind of the first circle, uh, this is what they wanted. So when patient X doesn't have capacity, it depends on what the next of kin wants. And once we decide what the next of kin wants, you know, without the backup of the family, I don't think we could have done this. So this is what the family wanted. And unfortunately, since the capacity issue comes in here, we cannot decide what patient X wanted. 
So I'll, I'll probably. I Doctor, really if you don't mind, know. I'll just uh, ask no. one question. Here, I'm Gurudas. Hello. Yeah, Doctor. Go, go on, please. The, yeah. uh, uh, how many hospitals are having this facility extended? Then second thing is it uh, insurance linked? And uh, uh, I am from CGHS, that is Central Government Employee. Is it CGHS also linked with this one? I want to know. Uh, to answer very briefly, as of now, uh, ours is the only hospital which is providing the service. And uh, to answer number two, this is not insurance linked as of now. But you know, the whole point of this conference is to ensure that uh, we have some kind of a social security for the elderly and some kind of health security for the elderly. So we'll be deliberating on that in due course. I'm afraid there will be a lot of questions. Amit will have a chat later on. Uh, but I think I'll have to close this session because there are a lot of wonderful speakers lined up. And uh, during lunch or during tea, we can always have a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Thank you so much for being patient and listening to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Amarnath. May I request Dr. Bajaj to kindly honor Dr. Amarnath for that wonderful speech this morning. Dr. Bajaj. Let's give Dr. Amarnath a huge round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Bajaj.